talk to you tonight about spirit-led parenting, all right? And if, um, if you don't have kids or your kids are already grown, I promise you everything we're going to talk about tonight still applies to you. Um, because it doesn't matter whether you're parenting, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to be married, it doesn't matter whether you're just working a regular job, all of us need to be spirit-led. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but I depend so much on the Holy Spirit. There's, there's nothing in my life um, that the Holy Spirit is not a, not a part of, and that I don't look to Him for help um, and assistance and when it comes to leading and pastoring this church, certainly. But when it comes to my marriage, when it comes to my kids, when it comes to just simple things, I ask the Holy Spirit to get involved. I, I mean, I know that may sound crazy to some of you, but I'll be working in the yard and can't figure something out. I'll say, Lord, just help me. Holy Spirit, help me do this. Because, you know, he lives on the inside of you and he knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. And uh, the Holy Spirit is not an it, as some people uh, refer to him. I may even accidentally refer to him that a few times tonight. It just happens. But the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he. He is a person. Uh, just like Jesus is a person and God is a person. The Holy Spirit, the Bible uh, describes the Holy Spirit as a person. And he's on the inside of, of us. And I'm going to tell you, in this day and hour that we live in, Raising children in this time in America, you need the Holy Spirit involved. You need the Holy Spirit's help. And you're going to see that tonight. I know you already know that, but you're going to see it tonight even more. Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. God is rebuking the people of Israel, <laughs> as so often we read about in the Old Testament. But he's, he's rebuking them, and he's laid out a few things. And in verse 13, he says, and this is the second thing you do. He said, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. I read this at every wedding ceremony that I perform. Because I want them to know God is witnessing the covenant that you're making between one another. This is not just a covenant between two people. This is not just, well, I promise this, that, and the other, and you promise that, then the other, and I'll do this for you, and you'll do this for me. It's way bigger than that. God is overseeing the, that covenant that's being made. He's the overseer of that covenant. And it's, it's not just the pastor that's standing there or the witnesses, the human witnesses. God is saying, no, I'm the chief witness, and I am witnessing the covenant that you are making between one another. God takes marriage very seriously. He takes the family very seriously because it's so powerful. It's so powerful both ways. It's powerful in the positive results that it can create, and it's powerful in the negative results that it can take. As a matter of fact, most of the problems that we see in our world, most of the, the violence and the, the crime and the things that we see in our world really go back to the family, the family unit. It has to do with how those kids were raised, and then they raised their kids, and, then, and it's a cycle that is perpetuated. But on the other hand, if godly people raise kids, and they put God in them, they put the Word in them, and they pass that, then it gets passed from one generation to another as well. And that's what God is saying here when he's, he's saying, he says, look, you don't understand while I'm not accepting your offering. You're, you're weeping with tears and saying, God, you know, answer my prayer, answer my prayer. And he said, no, I don't, I don't have regard for your prayer. And you say, why? He says, because you've been faithless to your, to your spouse. And I don't think he's necessarily talking about uh, sexual unfaithfulness, although it could include that. I don't think that's the only thing he's referring to here. He might would have used the, you know, the word adultery. But he, he says, no, you've been, you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And I love this, verse 15. It says, did he not make them one? Talking about the two that came together. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? When you get married 
a portion of God's Spirit is applied to that marriage. And it's no longer just... It, it's really a supernatural thing that happens. You know, when he says the two become one, he's not just talking about a physical act. He's talking about something that happens in the Spirit. There is a, a binding of the heart and a knitting of the heart that happens. And God's Spirit is put on that thing, on that marriage. And he says, and what was the one God seeking? I love this. Godly offspring. He lays out the full purpose for the family unit and for, and for marriage really to begin with is that godly offspring would be produced. Not just offspring, but godly offspring. That is the purpose of the family. That is why marriage was created because it was created by God and that is why the family was created is so that godly offspring would be produced and, and young people would be raised up by their parents to live godly, act godly, and then they would continue that cycle generation after generation after generation. You have no idea, if you are a parent right now in this room, you have no idea how much power and how much responsibility you have been given. Many times we look at it and we go, oh, I have two kids. No, no, you have way more than two. You know, I have three kids. No, because you're not thinking about the generations that are going to come out of them. You're not thinking about the, the hundreds of people that are going to be affected by the decisions that they make. It's way bigger than them. I'll, I'll say for one, in my family, if I look down my family, my family tree, uh, it's a disaster on, on either side, really. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a disaster on either side. And there's lots of horrible things in my family and not very like not very far off either not like distant uh, lots of things and I thank God that I had parents that stopped that cycle you know one day my brother and I were driving down the road and we were talking about some uh, some of our family members you know we were I just we were just talking about some of our family members you're not supposed to do that but we were it's not you. Lacey, my sister's here. It wasn't Lacey, okay? It wasn't anybody that's in this room. It was distant, you know, cousins and whatnot. And we were talking about them, and I just felt grieved in my heart. And I looked over at my brother, and I said, I said, you know, the only difference between us and them is God, though. Like, if, if you sit here and go, oh, I'd never, I can't believe they do that, this, that, and the other thing. The only reason that you don't look exactly like them is because God got in, involved in your life. You know, and, and we started talking about it, and I just began to realize, you know, the sacrifices that my parents made um, to stop that cycle of destruction that was a part of our family. You know, my dad um, died tragically. My real father, for those of you that don't know, Lynn is my, my stepfather, even though I consider him my, my father because he raised me from the time I was two. But my real father died tragically, and then he, I, there were four brothers. He died tragically. And then two of the brothers committed suicide, um, and one of them is still, still living. But it was a, a cycle of alcoholism and drugs and sexual perversion and all sorts of things. And I just thank God that my parents stopped that cycle. And as a result of it, if you look at my kids today, my kids are being raised by two godly people. And really, the same thing on my wife's side. Her parents stopped that cycle. It was a cycle of, of, of just destruction and sin and ungodliness. But her parents put a stop to it there. And so now you have two people coming together that are now raising godly offspring. And we haven't even seen the end of it. They're going to raise up. They're going to marry godly people. It's going to go on and on. And that is God's plan. He said that is the purpose that you raise godly offspring. It is not for them to be t-ball champions. Okay. Anything wrong with t-ball? No, of course not. My, I plan for my kids to play sports? No. But you do understand that's not the purpose. And I'm shocked at how many people, I just used t-ball as an example. We could give out a thousand examples. How many people will devote years, days, weeks, months to life for something that makes no difference? No difference in them, no difference in eternity, no difference in generations to come. It's just a huge distraction if you're not careful. But please understand, I'm not against t-ball, okay, or any extracurricular things for your kids. But you do understand that's not what God is seeking, is amazing t-ball players. I know it sounds ridiculous, but the way people live, you would think that, like, God must want this. Because, <laughs> I mean, these are Christian people, like, their whole life is devoted to some of these things. But, look... That's not what it said. And what was, what was God seeking? 
godly offspring. Look, they'll, do, they'll travel all over the world for whatever extracurricular thing their kids are doing, but won't make a sacrifice for them to go to youth camp or to be at church or to have godliness instilled in them. And put, Listen, that is way more important than anything else, especially in the generation that we live in. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't put godliness in them, when they get 14, 15, 16, you are going to begin to have some regrets. And you are going to realize that where we poured our time and energy is not having the, the results and the impact that I wanted it to have. It's important that our focus and our first priority is raising godly offspring because that's God's first priority. Amen? But this is a tough time. It's a tough time in America to be raising a family. You not only have, you know, terror attacks that are going on, shootings, killings that are going on. Not only do you have, um, you know, school shootings that are going on as well. I mean, our kids are at school and there's that danger. But then you have the dangers of social media, the Internet. You have... Uh, predators and, and perverts everywhere. You have other kids that are being affected then, then affecting your kids. So it's a very difficult uh, and dangerous time to be, to be raising children. And it takes a lot of wisdom that we can have from the Holy Spirit and from His Word. It's there for us. But it's going to take a lot of wisdom to, to raise kids in this day and age for them to turn out the way that you're wanting them to turn out. You know, there are things that can happen in a child's life or a teenager's life that affect them for the rest of their life. And I know we don't like to think that, well, they'll, they'll get over it. I, I pastor people every day that never got over it. It happens. Experiences they had, things they saw, things they got addicted to. And I believe it is a lie of the enemy to just comfort yourself by saying, Oh, all kids go through it and they'll get over it. No, they don't. I pastor people every day that never got over it. I talk to people, I sit with people in my office on a regular basis that are still dealing with things that happened in their teenage years or in their childhood years that could have been prevented. It could have been prevented. So... Our job then, as parents raising kids, is to ensure that they're raised the way that God wants them and to protect them and to preserve them, not to be, you know, Amish or anything like that, um, but to take our job very serious what we do. I'll tell you, most people in this room and in our church are nowhere near in danger of being Amish. Okay, that's what people start thinking. Oh, what, do you want us to be Amish? You want us to, you know, uh, throw the TV out and no cell phones, no internet? Look, nobody in this room is in danger of being Amish, okay, as far as I know. Like, that's, we're on the other end most of the time. Uh, we're on the other end of the spectrum. We allow way too much, way too much freedom, way too much access. They watch way too much stuff they shouldn't be. Well, they're exposed to way too much that they should be. So that's really the, the issue um, that we need to pull that back. Not, and, but we tell ourselves, oh, well, I don't want to be, you know, a stick in the mud and we want them to have fun. Well, we do. But we also want them to be godly. It's a difficult time. It's also a very confusing time. Um, things are trying to be put into your children that really wasn't tried to, uh, that really uh, was not attempted to be put in any other generation. You know, I, I shared several months ago about uh, the Disney Channel, for example. Disney introducing their first gay character uh, on a particular show. You know, there's no reason for kids to be being exposed to that or, or introduced to that, but there's an agenda. See, there's an agenda, and it's not a person, it's not a political party, it's not a group. That's not, it's a spirit that drives the whole thing. You have to remember what the Word of God said, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay, our fight is not with humans. So we get mad, like, well, why would Disney do that? And this has nothing to do with Disney. It has nothing to do with Hollywood. It has nothing to do with any group that's, you know, pushing for stuff. There is a spirit behind it that is trying to destroy the next generation. That's, that is his aim and his focus, is to, is to pervert them, to dilute them, to confuse them. And it's, there, there are agendas that are out there. But I'm telling you, if you're not careful, um, we, we really just about, and our kids are younger, but you just about cannot leave the television going. And even if they're watching a, t a show that, is, that we have approved, 
the commercials in between the show. I'm thinking this is a show for kids, but they've got commercials for adults in between. And I'm wondering about that. Or my kids are on the iPhone and they're playing a game that's for like toddlers. And they've got some, you know, advertisement popping up of a, of a woman that's half dressed. Why is that? Well, these things are, are exposing, they're coming to our kids and it's, it's exposing them to things way earlier than they should have been exposed to things. It's causing them to deal with things and think about things that they really shouldn't have to be thinking about at such a young age. And it's confusing them and it's difficult for them. But I'll, I'll just say this. If this is a difficult time and a confusing time for parents, then where does that leave our children? You know, um, because I think most of us as good parents look around and go, man, this is, this is it's hard to know the right thing to do and what to let them do, what to allow, what not to allow. It's confusing. And, and I'll just tell you as the parent this, if you find yourself being a little bit confused and overwhelmed, then where does that leave your, your children? I'll say out of, the, out of the two of you, you're in the best position to make the choices for the family. Now, most people would agree with that, and they would say, oh, yeah, we know that. I'm the parent. But often, people don't parent that way. Oftentimes, it's the children that are making the decisions, not the parent. And I'll just say that children do not know best. Parents know best. Okay? You are the one that has the experience, the wisdom, the Spirit of God, the responsibility, the task. To, to, to raise them and to do what is right, but it doesn't matter how um, smart, responsible your child is, you are the parent, not them. And you have to make hard decisions that, that are right for them, whether they like it or whether they don't, whether it's popular with them or whether it is or not, you have to make those hard decisions. It doesn't matter how good of a child you have, they need your input. And they need you to be the parent and make the decisions that need to be made. I'll give you an example. When I was a teenager, uh, I was on the right path. I was on the right track. I was doing right things. You know, at 15 years old, I'd gotten saved and given my life to God. I was getting up, spending, giving two hours of my morning uh, for prayer and Bible reading when I was 16 years old because I love God. I was preaching in our youth ministry. Like, I was definitely on the right path. I was going the right direction. But when I graduated high school, I had no desire to go to college. I didn't want to go to college. I was already in the ministry. I already had a position in the ministry. I already had a beautiful woman at my side. I had no reason to leave and go anywhere. I wanted to get married. I wanted to go in the ministry. That's what I wanted to do. But my mother, uh, she insisted that I go to college. And had it not been for her, I would not have gone to college. And of course, once I got there, that was part of my destiny. It was part of the plan of God for me to go to college. There was a lot of things that got put in me, a lot of people I met, connections I made that are serving me to this day. It was the will of God for me to go to college, but I couldn't see it, even though I was, I was praying every day, I was preaching, I was on the right path. It's not like I was a bad kid. I was as, probably as good of a teenager as you're going to get, but I still needed input from my parents so where does that leave other teenagers that they aren't doing those things? They need input. And I'm telling you, I know it's hard. They'll throw fits. They'll cry. They'll manipulate. They'll put pressure. Uh, but you are the parent. And your goal, you have to think beyond the here and now. And you have to realize, no, my goal is not to please you. That's not my primary responsibility. It's not to be your friend. Really, it's to protect you from yourself. That's really one of the main jobs of a parent is to protect the child from themselves because they are the biggest danger to themselves. And you have to protect them and, and, call, and help them do things that they don't want to do. And I know they will get angry at you. They will get mad, but you have to do what is right. Now, I told you I wanted to talk to you about spirit-led parenting. We're going to get into that. Mark chapter 1, verse 32 Mark chapter 1, verse 32. I know y'all are used to the scriptures being on the screen, but uh, I didn't get my, my scriptures to Pastor Brandon in time. I had them, but I forgot to send them to him. So you just have to, you have to go old-fashioned tonight and, and actually open your Bible or 
not so old-fashioned and use your phone. You can do that too. Mark chapter 1, verse 32. says, that evening... Now, now Jesus had been going throughout all the cities. He's healing people. He's casting out devils. He's got all these miracles that are happening. So the whole town is just stirred up. They've never seen anything like this. You know, it, it's just phenomenal. People are coming out of the woodwork to, to see what's going on. In verse 32, it says, That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. The whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Verse 35, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now, the reason I read this story is because I have uh, <clears throat> I've experienced this many times in ministry. Not, not, not nearly like what's going on there. But just where you have something in your heart that you feel like you're supposed to do. But then there's pressure from people uh, about what their expectations are that you're supposed to do. Right? And that's what's going on here. Just think about this situation. Jesus has come through with this miraculous power. There are people getting healed that have incurable diseases. Blind eyes. People that have been blind their whole life receiving their sight. People that have been deaf their whole life. Children that have been crippled being able to walk. Can you imagine the demands and the pressure from the people of that city like, Jesus, you're not going anywhere. I, you, not until my child gets... I mean, what would you do if you had a child that was, that was crippled or incurable and there was a man in your town that was healing everybody and all you had to do was fight through the crowd to get to him and you knew that your baby could receive healing? I mean, you would do whatever it took. That's the kind of pressure that Jesus was experiencing right here. Like, and obviously, he's filled with compassion. He knows there are still needs in the city. He knows there are still people that need him. So, but in the morning, he goes out to pray. He's, he's alone. He's praying. And the disciples come and they say, they say, everyone is looking for you. Why, why is everyone looking for him? Because the needs are still there. He healed a bunch of people yesterday, but there are still needs that have to be met. There are people that still need healing. So he's feeling that, that pressure. They're trying to put that pressure on him. The disciples are trying to put that pressure on him. And they're saying, look, everybody's looking for you. Why don't you come on out of the, the wilderness and heal some people? But he said, no, let us go on to the next town that I may preach there also. That is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out. So he stayed on focus and he continued going to the next towns. Now, some people might look at this and think that that's uncompassionate. They think, well, he doesn't love people. He's not, you know, what about all the other people in the city? But here's the one thing that you'll learn about Jesus, because this wasn't the only time that he did this, is that Jesus was not led only by people's needs. He was led by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit and not led by need. He's not led by pressure. Not led by what, what the, who the loudest person yelling is or the, the biggest problem. He's not led by any of that. He's led by the Spirit. And this is a huge lesson for us in raising our kids and parenting. We are not to be led by anything but the Spirit. We're not to be... Because sometimes you can become too overly attached in your child's issues and problems and what they're going through. And instead of being led by the Spirit, you're led by their issues or their problems. You're led, by, uh, you're led by how demanding they are. We have one of our kids is more demanding than the other. For those of you that know us, you know which one it is, but I'm not going to say. Uh, but so some of our kids are very demanding, but you can't be led by that. You have to be led by the Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to help you know what to do, what decisions to make, and that's why we're talking about spirit-led parenting tonight. 
I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to get involved and help us make decisions in our, in our parenting. The Holy Spirit can show you things about your kids that you would have never seen on your own. He can show you things about their personality, things about their temperament. temperament. He can show you things that are going on in their life that you had no idea was going on in their life. The Holy Spirit can show you that. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, Paul and Silas were traveling and preaching. In verse 6, it says, They went through the region of Phygeria and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. This is an example that we see in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas were led by the Spirit of God where to preach the Word. Now again, you would think they would be led by something else because they've been preaching in every city. Everybody needs the Word, right? You know, we're supposed to be preaching the world in all the, God, in all the world. So they're going through just preaching one city to the next. The next logical place for them, the next place on the map is Phrygia, And they get ready to go in and it says, The Holy Spirit forbid them. Now, could they have reasoned with themselves and gone in anyway? Absolutely. They could have. They could have said, this doesn't make any sense. We're, these people need the, the Word of God. We're going to go in and preach. But they would have been rejecting the counsel of the Holy Spirit. And this is another thing uh, that we see in this passage and that I've learned from the Holy Spirit is that a lot of times you don't even get an explanation. There's no explanation given here. He doesn't say that the Holy Spirit forbid them because of A, B, and C. It just says, the Holy Spirit forbid them. Have you ever felt like that? that? That's how you get it most of the time. That's how you get led by the Spirit most of the time. Is something is just not right. You don't know what it is. Your kid comes up and they say, hey, can I go stay the night at so-and-so's house? And everything looks fine on the natural. And you think, yeah, there's really no reason. And I've, I've told them no a dozen times in a row. And I really want to tell them yes because I feel bad. And as far as I know, these are good people, good parents. But something on the inside of you... Yeah, just not right. Well, you can be led in that moment by the Spirit or anything or everything else. You have to decide how you're going to parent. And that's why I say it's crucial to be a Spirit-led parent. Because I'm going to tell you that by you saying no to that, to that thing, whenever the Holy Spirit is, is checking you, you may save them from a life of destruction. And thank God for parents that are led by the Spirit. That can, that can step in and go, no, I don't know. What, well, why not? I, I just, I don't know. I just didn't, it doesn't sit right with me. I, didn't feel, I don't feel right about it. I don't think it's a good idea. And that's hard to do, isn't it? Especially when you have a demanding one. It's hard to just say no and not have all the reasons. And, you know, because you love them and you're not trying to be, you don't want to be mean to them. But, this is what we see in this passage. Paul and Silas had developed a lifestyle of being led by the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit said no, they didn't need another explanation. They just knew it's not right. And if I can encourage you with anything tonight, it would be to learn to follow that peace. Learn to follow the peace of the Holy Spirit. If, if, if your child is going somewhere, doing, participating in something, and you, you, it just, you don't have a peace about it, you need to follow that because the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. The Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. And he may, you may not have all the details, but you need to follow it. Sometimes there are relationships that your kids get in. Friendships or if they're older, dating relationships and just it doesn't sit right with you. Listen, you need to do everything in your power to cut that relationship off because I have seen teenagers' lives dramatically affected just by a wrong relationship. And it's our job as a parent to pray for them and to have the Holy Spirit involved to help know because they're not going to know. Most, most kids, are, and te they're not going to know. They're only looking at it from the natural, going, well, this is what I want to do, and I like this person, or I like this activity. Yeah, but they're not, they're not wise enough to see uh, the, the consequences, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit. In Psalm chapter 32 Verse 8. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule 
without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, here, I believe this is, is God promising to us that we can have instruction, direction, and leading from the Holy Spirit. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. But then he gives this warning. He said, so knowing that I'm your leader and I'm going to be leading you, don't be like a horse or a donkey that has to have a bridle in its mouth to make it go a particular way. I want it to be easy for the Holy Spirit to lead me. Some people say, you know, well, God, you're going to have to give me a sign. Well, you're like that mule that he's talking about. It's, what you're saying is it's difficult. Anytime God wants to get information to you, apparently it's difficult to, for him to get it to you. He's saying don't be like that. You need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You need to be prepared and ready for the Holy Spirit to speak to you at any time. On anything. On any subject. He says, don't be like a horse or a mule that is without understanding which must be curbed with a bit and bridle or it won't stay near you. No. He said, be ready to be led easy and, and often by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Now, what causes you to be... What does he mean when he said like a horse or, or a mule? What, calls, what would cause a person to be compared to a horse or mule? You know, I, I, we never owned horses or anything growing up, but when I was in college, I worked at a couple different horse stables, and uh, I got to be around them for a little while. And what I learned is that, like any animal, they have their own desire. They have what they want to do, and you can't reason with them, obviously, because they don't speak English. And so you can't explain to them what you want them to do. Um, all you can do is, is kind of communicate through various other ways. You can communicate through food, you know, you can put a little bucket with some grain in it, start moving it, you're communi- you know, I want you to come this way, come on, follow. You know, you start putting the saddle on them, it communicates, we're about to go for a ride. So there's little things you do, but you can't just clearly explain, you know, lay out a paragraph of words and explain what it is that you want them to do. And it's difficult oftentimes to get them to do what you want them to do because they have their own desires. I remember one time I've told this story before I think but I remember one time I was on this one horse and I don't know why I was on this horse because I probably was the least qualified person to be to be doing this I didn't have a whole lot of experience Um, but this one horse was barn sour which means every time you know he would get so far from the barn he would just start wanting to shoot back to the barn and so they had him out in this pen and the owner told me start him at this end and start riding him around in a circle, but as you get closer to the gate, he's going to want to take off towards the barn. Don't let him do that. I said, okay. <laughs> Easy enough. <laughs> so I got on the horse, and I'm riding him around, and I'm doing just like he said. You know, every pass, I'm getting a little bit closer to the gate, a little bit closer to the gate. And on one of these passes, we're coming. He starts, and the owner had told me, whatever you do, don't let him go to that, bar- to, to that gate. So, on one of the passes, we're coming near the gate, and he starts everything he has going towards the gate. And I grab the, the bridle, and I pull it as hard as I can the other way. So, I'm pulling as hard as I can to the left. He's pulling as hard as he can to the right. So, we're just going in a straight line. We're not going either way. And he's running full speed now towards a fence. Um, and I'm thinking, he's just, I don't know if he's going to jump it. I don't know if he's going to, I don't know what he's going to do. And so, I just had in my mind that he was going to stop. I don't know how I knew this, but when he got right up to the minute, he just turned sideways and stopped. And when he did it, there was so much momentum. It just flung me. And I flew. Like, if I had tried to hold on, I would have, I would have really, it would have really been bad. But I don't know. For some reason, I just knew what he was going to do. And so I had already stood up in my saddle. And when he stopped, I just jumped off. I was like airborne. And I just land right on this, this uh, wooden fence perfectly. Like, just land, and then the horse runs off. And the owner's like standing there looking at me like, what just happened? I was like, I gave it everything I had, man, but he, his desire was, you know, just too much. I couldn't overcome it. And you see, that's the problem with a horse or mule and what he's talking about. Like he says, don't be like a horse or a mule. In other words, you're going to have to lay your own desires down. And that's what really he's saying. You have your own desires, 
But you have to be more in tune with the desires that God has for your children even than your own desires for your children. Because sometimes your desires and what you want for your kids can override what God wants for your kids. And so you can sometimes be kind of out of tune with what God wants and out of tune with what the Holy Spirit wants and you're pursuing all these things and pushing them in this certain direction and it's not even what God has for them. We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. He promised us, I will instruct you, I will teach you in the way you should go, but don't be like a horse or a mule that has its own desires and is difficult to lead. Your own desires, the more of your own desires you have, the more difficult you are to be led by the Holy Spirit. The more difficult of a person you are to lead by the Holy Spirit. That's why sometimes people will ask, you know, when you get in the ministry and you're talking to other pastors and stuff, and they'll say, well, you know, what do you see? What do you see? What's your, what's your five-year plan for the church? You know, where do you want to be in five years, this, that, and the other? And, you know, you, we all have ideas and thoughts. But I just tell them sometimes that, you know, my biggest desire is just to be led by the Holy Spirit. And my experience with the Holy Spirit is that he don't usually give me a five-year plan. I mean, I, he tells me sometimes, you know, it's like you just got to be ready to be led at any point, at any time, to do whatever he says to do. I don't have all these preconceived ideas of what, I, what has to happen in our church or my marriage or my family. I just want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I think God designed it that way because it requires you to stay close to him. See, if, if he's the one giving you the instruction what to do, where to go, how to do it, and he just gave you five years worth, then a lot of times you would just, okay, I'm done with you. You're not meaning to, but I don't need you now. And you go on and you've got your plan and your idea for five years. But when you have to be led regularly by the Holy Spirit, it requires you to stay close to him and to go to him every morning and to seek him. God, what do you have for me this week? What do you have for me this day? And that's why I think Jesus said it the way he did. He said, just pray and ask God. Say, God, give me today this daily bread. Amen. Just give me the daily bread. That's all I need. Amen. Amen. You know, I think that a lot of parents, they do have this leading in their heart. Maybe they haven't trained themselves to listen to it. But they do have, most parents, especially godly parents do have this leading in their heart when it comes to their kids. They have this kind of sixth, you know, sense, so to speak, um, that they know things, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit. I wonder how many parents let their kids do things, go places, have things that they know in their heart is not right, but they let them do it anyway because of pressure from their kids or desire to please. I wonder how often that happens. You know, this week in the news, you may have seen the uh, shooting that happened at a, a teenage nightclub event. I don't know if you guys saw this in Florida. There was a, a nightclub that held a teen night, and there were kids as young as 13 that were there. And the event was called Teen Swimsuit Glow Party. All right, so... Apparently, I, you know, if you read the news story, you know, I guess kids are showing up in swimsuits and the lights are out and there's, you know, glow sticks and all kind of stuff for them. And this is at a nightclub. Now, I'm just wondering. The nightclub was filled with teenagers when the, the shooting happened. I'm just wondering, A, what kind of parent lets their kid go to this, number one, that, that is shocking. But number two, how many parents really didn't want to let their kids go? How, how many parents, they knew this, this isn't right. I, something's not right with this. But they let their kids go anyway. And in, many, and in some cases, it cost them their life. And several are still you know, in the ICU fighting for their life. I, you can't tell me, especially... If, if any of them were Christian, you can't tell me that they didn't have something in their heart knowing that something's not right. Because I believe even with ungodly people that they still, that God still tries to get involved in people's lives. It's crucial that we listen to the Holy Spirit, especially in the day and age that we live in. The other reason that it's crucial that we be spirit-led with our kids is not just to protect them from places they'll go or people they'll be in and all that. That's important. 
But other re- another reason is because your child, however old they are, your child is going through something right now, okay? Something in their mind, something in their thoughts, something in their emotions, something they're dealing with, maybe at school with a friend. It, it may not seem like a big deal to us, but they're going through things that are shaping them right now. There are questions that they have. There are questions that they have about God. There are questions that they have about their sexuality. There are questions that they have about the, the world. They're going through something. And it's, it's very important as a parent that you be in tune to what they are going through and what they are thinking about and what is happening in their emotions. I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I've been shocked many times to, to be driving down the road and just some off the wall strange phrase come out of the back from my back seat from one of my kids. I'm like, where did that come from? And then you look in the rear view and they're like just staring out the mirror. You know, I guess they're just been, their mind is just thinking. And sometimes you'll just kind of let that go. And you'll go, oh, they're just, you know, that's just my kid. You know, they're goofy, whatever. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will check you. No, you need to dig into that a little bit. That came from somewhere. That thought came from somewhere. You need to dig into that and find out what is going on in their life. And the Holy Spirit will help you know. You know, sometimes, yeah, it is just goofy. and You don't need to worry about it. But other times, you'll know in your spirit. I need to have a conversation with them about that. That is a, that is a topic that I need to pull them aside and to discuss with them. And listen, those conversations make a difference in their life. I still remember conversations that I had as a teenager, as a, as a child and a teenager, that affected me. And helped me make the right decisions along the way. Your child will listen to you. And uh, the counsel and input that you give them make a difference. So you got to be spirit led about it. There are temptations that your child is facing that you may not know about. There may be content that they've seen on the internet. They don't want you to know about it. And they're struggling with it. And unless you get involved, it's just going to progress. Well, the Holy Spirit can show you that. You can just be walking by in a room and see them over there on their phone and something in your spirit say, oh, something's not right. I need to, I need to go check, check that out, check what they're doing. They could be in their room with the door closed and you walk by and just something in your spirit is like, something's not right. I need to go in there and check on them, see what's going on. So you can know things that you couldn't know otherwise because of the Holy Spirit. There are experiences that they may have had that you need to know about. Things that have happened when they were outside of your care, outside of your supervision, that you really have no way of knowing, but the Holy Spirit can show you. This, I just had a couple in my office last week that this very thing happened to. She was, she was driving down the road with her teenage son, and just in her, in her spirit, something just kept coming. And she just started prodding him and talking to him about it. And he began to reveal to her some things that had happened uh, with another child. And she had no way of knowing uh, that. But by the spirit, she just knew. She didn't know what it was, but she knew something wasn't right. And thank God she was spirit-led. And now she's able to walk that through. And that was really one of the reasons they were coming to meet with me was, man, what do we do about this? How do we go from here? Well... Thank God that the Holy Spirit brought it, brought it to her. So there are experiences that they may have had that you don't know about that you need to know about. And you can know it by the Holy Spirit. Last scripture I want to read tonight and we're going to be done. This is in Luke chapter 5 verse 22. And what's going on here? Jesus has just healed a man... And after he healed him, he said, your sins are forgiven. And so the people that are there are going, man, can he do that? Can he forgive sins? Who is this guy that says he can forgive somebody else's sins? And in verse 22, it says, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? And then he went on to deal with the issue. But you see, no one actually said it out loud. No one actually spoke up and said, can you forgive sins, Jesus? In this instance, it says Jesus just perceived their thoughts. How did he do that? Is it because he was Jesus? No. 
It wasn't because he was Jesus, because Jesus laid aside all of his, he emptied himself of all of his power when he came to the earth. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. If you look back to when Jesus received the Holy Spirit, up to that point, he did no miracles. For the first 30 years of life, he did no miracles. But after he received the Holy Spirit, then we see him doing all the miracles that he did. The Bible actually says that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. So he had the Holy Spirit on the inside of him. And it was by the Holy Spirit that he perceived their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. He may not have had like the exact you know, word for word, but he, he perceived this is, they're thinking on this topic and he was able to address it. Well, how many of you believe that God can do that with you and your kids? Now, you don't have to know their thoughts or anything like that, but you can perceive things that are going on in them and internally that you would never be able to know otherwise. We need the Holy Spirit in this day and hour. Your kids need spirit-led parents. Amen in this hour that we live in. 